It's a sultry night in July. You've fallen asleep in the armchair. Abruptly, you startle awake, disoriented. The television set is on, but not the sound. You strain to understand what you're seeing. Two ghostly white figures in coveralls and helmets are softly dancing. They make strange little skipping motions, which propel them upward amid barely perceptible clouds of dust. But something's wrong. They take too long to come down. Encumbered as they are, they seem to be flying. A little. You rub your eyes, but the dreamlike tableau persists. Of all the events surrounding Apollo 11's landing on the moon on July 20th, 1969, my most vivid recollection is its unreal quality. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin shuffled along the gray, dusty lunar surface, the Earth looming large in their sky, while Michael Collins, now the moon's own moon, orbited above them in lonely vigil. Yes, it was an astonishing technological achievement and a triumph for the United States. Yes, the astronauts displayed death-defying courage. Yes, as Armstrong said as he first alighted, this was a historic step for the human species. But if you turned off the byplay between mission control and the sea of tranquility, with its deliberately mundane and routine chatter, and stared into that black and white television monitor, you could glimpse that we humans had entered the realm of myth and legend. Once upon a time, we soared into the solar system for a few years. Then we hurried back. Why? What happened? What was Apollo really about? Apollo conveyed a confidence, energy, and breadth of vision that did capture the imagination of the world. It inspired an optimism about technology and enthusiasm for the future. If we could fly to the moon, as so many have asked, what else were we capable of? We may have found that perspective just in time, just as our technology threatens the habitability of our world. Whatever the reason we first mustered the Apollo program, however mired it was in Cold War nationalism and the instruments of death, the inescapable recognition of the unity and fragility of the Earth is its clear and luminous dividend, the unexpected final gift of Apollo. There are places in and around our great cities where the natural world has all but disappeared. You can make out streets and sidewalks, autos, parking garages, advertising billboards, monuments of glass and steel, but not a tree or a blade of grass or any animal besides, of course, the humans. There are lots of humans. Only when you look straight up through the skyscraper canyons can you make out a star or a patch of blue. Reminders of what was there long before humans came to be. It's not hard going to work every day in such a place to be impressed with ourselves. How we've transformed the earth for our benefit and convenience. But a few hundred miles up or down, there are no humans. 
our impact on the universe is nil. In the last 10,000 years, an instant in our long history, we've abandoned the nomadic life. We've domesticated the plants and animals. Why chase the food when you can make it come to you? For all its material advantages, the sedentary life has left us edgy, unfulfilled. Even after 400 generations in villages and cities, we haven't forgotten. There are now people on every continent and the remotest islands, from pole to pole, from Mount Everest to the Dead Sea, on the ocean bottoms, and even, occasionally, in residence 200 miles up. Humans, like the gods of old, living in the sky. These days, there seems to be nowhere left to explore. Victims of their very success, the explorers now pretty much stay home. Maybe it's a little early. Maybe the time is not quite yet. But those are the worlds promising untold opportunities beckon. Just now, there are a great many matters that are pressing in on us that compete for the money it takes to send people to other worlds. Should we solve those problems first? Or are they a reason for going? Our planet and our solar system are surrounded by a new world ocean, the depths of space. It is no more impassable than the last. <laughs>